All right, welcome to the Rocket Fuel Podcast. Today, my guests are Omar Solomon, co-founder and visionary, Nick Friedman, co-founder and visionary, and Roman Cowan, brand president and integrator, all from College Hunks Hauling Junk. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, great to have you here. And so people that have been listening to me for any amount of time are already scratching their heads and going, wait a minute. Did Mark just say that there are two visionaries at that company? He's always told us that, uh, you know, there should only be one visionary. So we'll get into all of that uh, momentarily. So just to kind of tease ahead a little bit. But before we get into it, uh, I would love it, Omar or Nick, if one of you would kind of give us a little bit of the genesis of your company. So, so how did this thing get started? So Omar and I went to high school together. Uh, we actually met in 10th grade in detention of all places. And <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Brought up to follow the more traditional career path, work hard in school, get good grades, get a job. And it was actually the summer before our senior year of college. Omar's mom had this beat up cargo van from her furniture store and said, you know, why don't you go out and do something with the van? Uh, and we credit her not just with the van, but actually the name. She was like, you know, you guys could be like college hunks who haul junk. And we all kind of laughed about it at first. And then Omar said, you know what, let's put that on computer printout flyers, stuck it in mailboxes. The phone started ringing. People had a need yeah. for the service. They thought yeah. the name was catchy. Uh, we ended up winning an entrepreneur. Omar ended up winning an entrepreneurship competition our senior year. And then when we graduated, after a brief stint in the corporate world, we said, you know what, let's make the business a full, full year-round venture. So I, we always tell the story when we first started, we, Omar and I were, were the college hunks. We were doing all the work ourselves. Right. So we were driving the truck, answering the phone, hauling the junk. We had the 800 number on the back of the truck routed to our cell phones. And people would call to complain about erratic driving, and we'd be the one in the driver's seat answering the phone, you know, apologizing, right. you know, firing right. ourselves. You know, we don't condone that driving. We'll, we'll tell those guys to be safer. Uh, probably fired ourselves at least three or four times that uh, that first summer. So uh, eventually learned how to work on the business, not in it. And then, of course, uh, we discovered the, the traction in EOS and rocket fuel tools and now we're, you know, a 15 plus year overnight success. <laughs> 50, right. 15 plus years overnight success. That's people don't see those first hard years always, do they? So, so Omar, tell me a little bit from your experience in those early days. I'm, I'm really kind of curious about, you know, there's the two of you trying to do everything by yourself, right? And then you kind of start to get some, some folks to help you. Uh, what was sort of the thing that made you see, you know what, we really need to start building a team. We really need to find some way to, to be able to, to grow this thing even bigger because we're just not going to be able to carry this all ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, before EOS, there was a, a book called The E-Myth, as I'm sure uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're familiar with. And Michael Gerber. Uh, uh, someone handed us that book kind of probably after one of those days that uh, Nick described where we were driving the truck and getting yelled at um, while taking uh, phone calls from clients. And so I think Nick read the book and then he's like, hey, man, you got to read this book. And it just spoke to us. It was exactly mm. the predicament we were in. We were in the business, not on the business. Um, right. And it was going to be all about people and then also all about systems. So um, that was like the aha moment for us where we're like, okay, if we spend the time and effort uh, to create these processes and systems and can work on the business, you know, we can actually have two trucks, five trucks, 10 trucks, and, you know, one day hopefully uh, open up locations in, in other cities. Um, and, and that's what happened. I mean, we were able to get off the trucks and, um, you know, it was literally one truck at a time. You know, it's not a tech business, so we don't scale uh, the same way Facebook or Google does. Um, but it right. was, you know, one truck at a time. And we quickly kind of grew from 05 to 08 um, in, in the D.C. area and then started franchising in, in 08. Uh, um, so how, how big were you when you started when you started franchising? How, how many trucks did you have? I think we were ahead about 12 in DC, Nick. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, remember, I think we were about 12 trucks in DC and we we're, you know, we're doing well over a million dollars in, in sales. Yeah. It was still premature. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it was our third year of business. I think we started franchising. So we were new to business and then decided to become new to franchising. Uh, um, and so that, yeah. When you had 12 trucks, so I kind of get how the scaling works when you've, you, you add a truck and you've got a, you know, a person or a group of people or whatever that, that work a truck. I kind of see that piece of it. But then the back office, right, the back end of this thing, all the stuff that's got to happen there. How many people were kind of working administratively when you had 12 trucks on the road? Uh, at that time, I think we had kind of an operations manager and like a call center agent who was picking up the phone because we, we didn't want to be the ones answering the phone okay. while driving. So we, we got ourselves off the truck. We got sort of an ops manager to open up and, and close and, and meet the crews in the morning. 
And then I think we had like a part-time administrator slash bookkeeper. Uh, and, and that was sort of the, the origin of having any form of org chart or accountability right. chart. There was still right. a lot of, you know, just overlap and, and uncertainty and, and blurred lines, quite frankly, and accountability and responsibilities. Uh, and as Omar mentioned, we always had this sort of glamorized view of what franchising would be. We thought it was like, right. oh, you know, this is so hard work <laughs> running a business. If we franchise the company, we can make passive income as royalties right. and everybody else will go out and do it. But it's it's far from the reality of franchising, a very steep learning curve, a very right. long path to, to scale in franchising. So uh, we kind of became students of entrepreneurship and uh, began attending conferences like the International Franchise Association. And then right. obviously, again, plug for, for the, the, the EOS tools that we discovered and and ultimately try to start putting rhythms in our you know morning huddles and and rocks and, and things of that nature to uh, just kind of institutionalize and, and and put some more structure around the business. So I you know I would say before we knew about the visionary integrator relationship, right. uh, I was kind of the de facto integrator because even though I'm skewing more of as a visionary on on the personality profile right. Uh, I feel like I was capable of, of trying to tackle the structure, and I'm a little bit more obsessive compulsive about details. Omar was a little bit more what I would describe as pure visionary, just sort of like things will fall into place. I've got these all, all these different ideas. Let's try to tackle them all at once. And I was trying to do things out of the book, like, no, this, this book says we've got to do it right. this way. We've got to, you know, we've got to follow this process and, and protocol. Do you agree with that, Omar? Yeah, no, they, I, I agree with that for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely – uh, uh, not an integrator. I'm not a good manager of people and I'm not organized. So, um, there's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> I love it. He's owning it. That's great. Well, I, I'll own it. You know, that's why I love this model because, um, it, it sort of recognizes the things that you can do and, and the things that you can't. And, um, you know, it's not a bad thing to not be able to do certain things and it's good to be good at other things. So, you know, I think we were naturally, I think a little bit inclined to those two, even though we both are bees, I think we both that's why we were good partners, you know, up until yeah. Roman came on and then beyond that. Um, but yes, I do think that that's an accurate assessment. <laughs> so I want to bring Roman in here in just a second. Yeah. But so, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, you sort of naturally, uh, you know, were able to kind of gravitate towards, you know what, this isn't necessarily the stuff I love, but I can, I can handle this for us and I can handle this other stuff for us. And so you kind of worked it out and kind of made it work. And I've got to believe there was a lot of, a lot of trust uh, in each other to be, be able to do that right and and not not let the egos get in the way and 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 whatever as you're kind of working through that before we in, we went and, and identified somebody like roman Im that immensely immensely i mean look so the fact that omar and i were friends in high school the same kind of arguments we had as friends were the same kind of arguments we had as business partners and we never let that impact our friendship when we'd be arguing over stuff in high school and so we never really let that impact our friendship or business relationship when we'd be arguing over it as business partners and and so I think you you hit the, the key on it. The trust and and ego were two things that a hundred percent had to be foundational and kept in check. Yeah. Never took things personally. If if one of us was mad at the other person, we would let it be known. But then yeah. it was right back to the business. It was never any sort of resentment or or harboring frustrations under yeah. the surface that, that that weren't bubbling up. And I think the fact that we had that relationship and had the business as our you know collective priority, had shared vision and values. That allowed us to keep the business as, as a priority and the results as a priority. Yeah, I hope you guys realize how special that is because there's so many, uh, you know, companies I've worked with, folks I've, 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 you know, had the experience around that it just didn't work out that way. They were friends, sometimes best friends, you know, or even, you know, family members and the business, the, you know, the crucible of pressure is just stuff that goes on when things get tough and crazy and weird and all that. It just couldn't stand it. They didn't have a strong enough foundation there to be able to, to make it through. So that's really cool and really special that, that you two did. And so anyway, so the story continues and you guys, you keep growing, you, you start learning about franchising, you do all that. You, you, I know now you sort of have a hybrids where you've got some franchise, some corporate, uh, locations. Is that true? It Was is. it yeah, always, We've got about 200 franchisees. We, we currently operate four corporate locations, so it's, it's okay. a small piece of our Okay, so it's a small brand. piece, small piece. Yeah. Okay, okay. so then as you're, you're really growing, uh, you, know, you start to build out some help in the team and talk to me about what triggered, you know what, we need, we need this thing called an integrator that ultimately led, led you to identify Roman as that person. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll backtrack to first how we met Roman and then, and then how the intersection of, of needing an integrator came into place. So when we first started franchising, we moved down to Tampa, Florida. This was right around the time of the housing crisis, so our business wasn't lifting off as fast as we thought it might when we started okay. into franchising. And we submitted our business to the University of Tampa. They were doing a marketing case study competition. So Roman was actually a senior at University of Tampa undergrad at the time. Perfect. His team came in like third place uh, in this competition. But I can remember it like it was yesterday. It was one of those like surreal moments where Roman was giving the presentation. And he goes, you know, one day I'm going to be CEO of College Hunks and Nick and Omar are going to be sitting on the beach nice. drinking pina coladas. Nice. And I remember having this like almost like out of body experience as he said that. Like he said, "That's exactly you know, what I want." That sounds amazing. <laughs> we were this away from ever reaching that uh, point in in our business. We didn't have two pennies to rub together, but we. I was like, "That sounds incredible." Uh, so uh, Roman really wanted to work with us, but we didn't have the position for him or the mm. resources to hire him out of college. So he went off to do his uh, his own thing, got his CPA, his MBA, got real world work experience. And this is a testament for following up. He sent us like a LinkedIn message three or four years later. Yeah. And I don't often respond or read, even read my LinkedIn messages, but he had mentioned that he was in finance and was looking at, you know, still interested in working with us. And literally like three months after he sent that message, our controller at the time left to take a new job. And so I, his, his LinkedIn message kind of popped into my head and I right. reached out to him and he was actually on his way to put an acceptance letter in at a public accounting firm. So he kind of intercepted him at the 11th hour of, of this acceptance letter uh, and he joined as our financial controller. So still, okay. you know, kind of young and, and, and green. Uh, but again, we use the word humble, uh, you know, was always very clear, like, hey, you know, I know I can do a lot for you guys, but if you ever want to hire people over me or a CFO or, you know, VP or whatever, I'm never going to be offended. I'm, I'm not going to purport to know more than I know. And at that time, we were pretty uh Pretty, I was pushing the EUS model pretty heavy onto the team. Like, I, you know, okay. I was reading the books. We would bring in an implementer periodically to help us, you know, with an L10 meeting rhythm. Okay. And so I think we decided that we needed an integrator, that Omar and I were starting to burn out as the founders. I, okay. I had been kind of playing this role as de facto integrator, but it wasn't my, my nature. So I was like, right. I was doing things in the uh, column of, you know, good at, but really don't enjoy doing. Right. Uh, so burning my fuel pretty, pretty heavy. Right. And uh, we did a whole external search for an integrator. And as I started reading down the, the checklist of what an integrator does, you know, I, I came to Roman. I was like, Roman, do you realize that you already do all of these things for the company and, and for us as founders, even though you don't have this title and you're not, you know, in this senior leadership position. So, like, you're already integrating the company. You're the one putting the scoreboard in place and taking Nick and Omar's crazy vision and right. running it through a metric uh, process and, and have, helping us prioritize and put stuff back on the shelf and, and giving us an outlet to, right. to get our ideas on the table. So, so we, you know, we, we, we made Roman the, the integrator and, 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 you know, haven't looked back since. I, I can trace back, you know, like if we were to show you guys a chart, the, the exponential growth curve, it, it really is like pouring rocket fuel on, on the fire. As, as, no as, kidding. But we were doing maybe like 10 million in revenue at the time, and now we're doing over 200 million in annual sales. And, oh. you know, probably what it's been six or seven years as, as integrator. Oh, I uh, love that. that. That time took place. All right. So, Roman, let's get you into the, into the story here. So, <laughs> I want you to back up a little bit, though, from go back to when you were that working on the project at uh, University of Tampa, right? And you're, and you're first getting exposed to the company and kind of what did it look like to you then? What was your impression of, of where these guys were headed and what this company was all about and, and going to be able to do? So, um, first of all, Nick definitely flatters me. So uh, I think he makes me look better <laughs> than I certainly am. I think it was a big team effort that gave that hockey stick growth. So I'll first of all, I'll say that. The second piece is... Um, when I met Nick and Omar, Nick Omar and uh, a gentleman, Stephen Nichols, they walked into the room wearing my two favorite colors, orange and green. So that was kind of cool. At the time, even though I was a senior in college, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, right? Um, I had studied accounting, but I didn't quite think that I wanted to go in the, you know, public accounting world. I heard, right. I heard about the long hours and just somewhat of a boring life. And I was like, I want to do more. I want to help people. And then in comes these two, two entrepreneurs talking about their literal sole purpose is to help entrepreneurs be successful in business and at the time they were talking about struggling entrepreneurs and i always gravitated towards folks who, who were struggling because i have this like obsession about helping others and trying to mm -hmm. like say okay i was able to help someone get better 
And so when Nick and Omar shared their stories, it really resonated with me, just them talking about um, struggling franchise partners. Nick already told you what type of time we were in in the recession, mm -hmm. right. and they were new to franchising. And I kind of fell in love with the guys, their enthusiasm. And I told my group um, after they walked in, and I'm talking about just the passion on Nick and Omar's face is something I kind of truly fell for. You know, it was like love at first sight, the, right. the brand. And I told my group that day, we're meeting this Friday um, to go over this project, and we're going to be in the top five. There were about 60 groups that got the, the, the project. And I was like, I need to be in the top five because I want to make a great impression uh, to these two guys. That It means that much to me. So. Um, that was that's the first thing that I noticed with Nick and Omar. They were they were humble and they cared more about others than themselves, the franchisees. Now I know selfishly you got to care about the franchisees because that's how you benefit. But at right. the time, I bought it, I ate it all up, and I and I you know I haven't looked back since. I was very persistent, like Nick said, and I am grateful that they took a chance on me. Yeah. So you so you come back into the organization after you go you know continue your your learning curve right your own your own path, and you come back in in a slightly different role. So you're not the integrator yet. And then talk to me about how you, how you really, uh, you know, learned what this integrator role was, and how you began to process thinking about, you know, is this something that that I, I want to do and, and and that I would be good at. Well, as Nick said, um, Nick's one of my mentors, and he's big on books. He's big on processes. He, he reads a lot of books. To Tomar's point, he bring he, he's brought back quite a lot of books for me to read. He if he goes off to a conference, he'll come back with notes. It's something I really love and appreciate about uh, Nick. Um, and he brought EOS to us. And as he gave us books to read, I would identify that I think I was um, similar to this role that was being described. But I never went to Nick and Omar and said anything about it. It wasn't, it wasn't like I applied for the role or anything like that. We truly right. went out looking for an integrator. And while I feel like I am always, I, I have a pain in my stomach when I see things being done inefficiently right. or if there's no process or if you have to reinvent the wheel every single right. time. Um, so I, I knew the role resonated with me, but at the time it wasn't about self-doubt. It was about a matter of, I, to Nick's point, I think I'm a little humble at times. And I, and I said to myself, I would love to see somebody come in here so I can learn from them. And uh, hopefully one day I could potentially play that role for Nick and Omar, like I told them back in 2009. So that was kind of the, the position that I was in. But as Nick was introducing the role to us, I found that I, I checked a lot of the boxes right. internally, and I internalized that. And, and it wasn't until Nick and Omar came to me and verbalized that is when I realized it's not only me that observes that, it others seem it to too. feel the same yeah. way, which is great. So talk to me a little bit uh, about the search. Okay, so before we, we say, okay, you know, Roman, we think this is you. So you're, you're, at, you're out in the market. You're looking for somebody. Uh, you know, what, what did that process look like? Did you get somebody to help you? Did you approach it just like you would hiring any other, any other position? I, you know, I don't think we had a lot of experience hiring for executive leadership roles back then. I, we still, I think, struggle a little bit with, with that process. Uh, and so at the time, I think we had talked to a few recruiting firms. It was still, this was probably in like the 2000, I want to say 15, 16 time frame. Okay. Uh, so the integrator recruiting nomenclature wasn't as prevalent, I think, as right. it is today. I think we talked to a few folks from LinkedIn that knew the EOS model, knew the, the rocket fuel model, and knew sort of kind of how to look, go out and look for integrator specific positions. Uh, but we, we just didn't feel like we were finding something that, that felt like it, it hit the, the nail on the it's head. Mark. It was, yeah. oh, there, there were people that had relevant experience leading companies or, or you know, VP of ops type titles. Uh, but the one thing that I think was, we kept finding coming back to with Roman was he had the finance and numbers down, right. but he also had sort of like the people uh, uh, relationship soft skills. And that was sort of right. a hard uh, uh, dual skill set that we were finding. It was like we would find people with numbers, uh, yeah. but they didn't have quite sort of the logic or, or people relationship, right. you know, communication skills. But we'd find people that were really gregarious and, and, and charismatic, but they, didn't, they weren't as data driven right. uh, as Roman was. So it, it, it started to become more apparent that he has this sort of uh, unique uh, skill set of, of being right. numbers and data driven and logic based, but also having a really charismatic way of relating to people and helping right. them see uh, the other sides of the coin. And I'll say that Omar and I as founders, 
have a tendency to have very knee-jerk emotional reactions. You know, you call our baby ugly, we're going to call you ugly. <laughs> and whereas, like, it, it, with Roman, it's like if somebody calls the baby ugly, he's going he's gonna to try to unpack that and be like, okay, right. well, let's talk about that. You know, let's talk about the baby and let's look at is the baby really ugly or is that a right. perception of, you know, of, of how you're seeing things. Right. You're, you're in a, you know, a, an emotional state of mind. And so uh, when we started realizing how he was able to sort of diffuse conflict with franchise owners or employees while also, you know, communicating Omar and my vision and, and taking a lot of the weight off of our right. shoulders, you know, it, it started to feel like that entrepreneurial nirvana that, that you know, the rocket fuel uh, model. Uh, yeah, I uh, love, to lo- love that. And I love that you kind of sense that that need for both the detail orientation and the and the, the soft skills of being able to, you know, lead people really and manage people, hold them accountable. Um, Omar, I'm curious, as, as this all kind of started to become real, and it sounds like Nick was kind of beating the drum for EOS and Nick's probably kind of beating the drum for, Hey, let's get an integrator. And meanwhile, you guys have sort of had this, you know, this co-founder relationship. And now we're starting to bring some, some, a different kind of structure here with a different kind of a, a role, uh, the, the integrator role coming into play. How, how are you thinking about that? I mean, uh, early on, were you, uh, were you a little bit nervous or uncertain about how that might play out, how that might change things or what, what was your view? No, I mean, I think, you know, it was sort of the same. Uh, if you just fast forward from when Nick handed me the email to, you know, he handed me this book and it, right. it, it, again, it just spoke to me. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly who I am. That's exactly all my problems. Um, so if you are telling me, the, I always thought that just wasn't like not something that you talk about. I, you know, you had to do yeah. it all or you had to figure it yeah. out. And I was like, oh, there's an actual platform and a, and a channel where that allows you to be this visionary and bring someone in that can then, you know, hold people accountable and manage people and actually get things finished uh, and not just started, um, which is something that I also have the, you know, I can start a hundred things, but I won't be able to finish them all or probably right. not finish one of them. So um, it was just for me, uh, it was like uh. a breath of fresh air. I mean, it took some time, you know, from the first, we, you know, I guess the same page meeting, you know, yep. and then sort of fast forwarding to now, I mean, it's evolved, but it's just really to Nick's point is it, it you can trace the success like that exponential growth curve really hit um, sort of right when those meetings started. And obviously yeah. it's not all because of that, but, you know, that's it was a big part of it. And, and it just yeah. created the outlet for us to take the big chances, 10x the business look for the big elephants, um, you know, look for the big marketing ideas, uh, and then really kind of carry the, the, the vision and, and the culture of the brand. Um, yeah. You know, yeah as, and as I, public I, figures. I think I'll add that, you know, I, like I used to yell at Omar on certain things cause like there'd be certain like follow through of things that he and I were sort of taking ownership of, right. but it was, you know, in some cases when you're trying to push a visionary into uh, more of a management type role. It's like squeezing a square peg into a round hole. It just right. wasn't his natural inclination. Right. So it's like, Omar, you know, did you follow up with that uh, report? <laughs> did you, you know, finish this, you know, and, and I didn't like doing those reports. I just knew they had to get done. Right. So it was like I was doing them and I was upset that Omar wasn't doing them. And then the, I think the other thing is that we hesitated a little bit. We felt, I think at least I felt a little bit of founder's guilt of like, Hey, if we're not as involved in the day-to-day management or the employees aren't seeing us as much, right. people aren't reporting directly to Nick and Omar, if the franchisees aren't picking up the phone and calling us first, are we going to be viewed as like, hey, we're just sitting back right. drinking pina coladas yeah. or do people right. think that we're still adding value? Right. And so um, there was a little bit of that. So Omar and I yep. actually even wrote, I think we took turns writing letters to the franchise owners and That's to right. the team. About that. of yeah. you know, our evolved role. Like, what does it mean that we're moving from, right. you know, founders to visionaries? And what does it mean that Roman is going to be the integrator? Yep. Uh, and, and it, you know, we took a, just a lot of descriptions of what those roles are to, to share that with the team so that it, it was almost cathartic for us to be able to put that on paper and, and then yeah. eventually send on that email. That's a cool and Mark, way to I'll handle it. I'll just add one, Go, one bit. Um, What you're hearing from Nick and Omar, that introspection, um, that willingness to embrace our differences and awareness of your your strengths, that's not typical. I talked to a lot of other folks in my seat, and 
sometimes the visionary isn't quite as introspective and isn't quite as willing to let go of the vine, right? And so that leadership that they're demonstrating here during this interview just tells you why I was able to be successful, right? Because we can trust each other and I get the respect level that I think is required for this relationship to work, especially yeah. in a 2v1 uh, situation. Yeah, so that's, Roman, I can yeah, see... That's another I can see, Sorry, go ahead. I can... Yeah, you know, I can. Just, I can see why, why Roman, why they really like and appreciate you. I've, I've already seen you sort of defer when they were trying to give you credit for the the big, you know, <laughs> jump in the curve, and you're like, no, no, it's team effort, right? And now you're giving them credit for for how, you know, how <laughs> introspective true. and how real they are. Which which is you're right on both points, right? And so that's just being honest and calling it like you see it, and that's super valuable, and that's that's scarce in its own right. But you know, visionaries, uh, I see again and again uh, on, going through this on their own they'll typically think of it as some version of being put out to pasture, right? <laughs> and, and it's kind of like, well, I don't feel like I'm doing anything. And, and the aha that they get to at some point, you, you know, y'all wrote letters, right? You, that was your way to kind of process this and try to communicate it. Eventually what they'll get to maybe six months, maybe a year later is they'll, they'll realize, and usually it's through the interaction with a, with a really great integrator that, you know what, just because it doesn't feel like work to me doesn't mean it's not super valuable for the company. Right. And the reality is because Roman was able to take a bunch of this stuff and give you space and energy. Right. So, Nick, all that energy you're burning up doing that stuff that you that had to be done, even though you didn't like doing it right now, all that energy is kind of freed up to, to think and, and look out and kind of all this big stuff. Right. Omar, you're talking about the big elephants, right? The big things that are out there that we can kind of go go take on. Uh, you know, that's all part of unlocking the, you know, the, the power that's that's in this thing. So it's really, really cool to hear hear how you kind of get to that place. So now let's, let's get into the, you know, one of the things I'm really curious about is, all right. So, so y'all have this really, uh, to my eye, unusual structure with two visionaries. You know, I, I get people that'll come to me all the time and, and, and ask for this, uh, and ask if it's okay. And consistently, you know, what I've seen work and, and, and what I've, what I've coached people into is, is no, you know, you, you want to have one visionary, you want to have one integrator. Uh, and, and the reasons why I teach that are it's about clarity of vision is one, and it's about where the integration happens. So think about this. You know, when you have two visionaries and the integrator is reporting into the two visionaries, now all of a sudden it's a little bit squirrely because who's the integrator report to? Right. And when we, when we teach about accountability, we always try to try to have that eyeball to eyeball accountability. So we get that integrator uh, accountable to one person. And in effect, what, what the integrator has to do is they have to integrate that vision. So they have to kind of bring it back down into one thing and then push it back out to the rest of the organization. And then the other tricky part is for the two visionaries to stay on the same page, right. And stay aligned so that we can, we can do this. So I'm really curious, how, how is this working? How, how are y'all doing it? How are you, let's, let's deal with first, how are you staying aligned? How are you staying on the same page first, Omar and Nick? How did Omar and Nick stay on the same page? So we, we, we do a, uh, a monthly same page meeting, uh, which, you know, if, if we're, I guess, thinking of it from a pure U.S. standpoint, maybe this would be described more as like an owner's box meeting okay. uh, where, where Omar and I, we're coming together as what we're calling ourselves co-visionaries, but we're kind of coming together and sitting in the owner's box. And then Roman is coming in as the integrator and, and Omar and I have call it a hundred ideas. We've come up with the past month on a right. spreadsheet, right. We're going down one by one. Uh, we're either talking through it or uh, we're putting it as a to do for Roman to follow up with somebody on the team to follow back up on. Uh, we're leaving it as a parking lot item or a future rock where we're putting no action needed. We just needed to talk about it. And uh, Omar and I and Roman are on a group text string where from time to time, if an idea pops into our head, we'll send a text and then one of us will remind the, the text string, hey, save this one for the same page. Let's not okay. get spun up in this. Uh, every now and again, Omar or I will do an end around and text one of the team members and throw them way off course. Uh, and Roman will remind us, hey, save <laughs> those ideas for the same page or go through me before texting, Good. you know, so-and-so to, uh, to, you know, start working on this side of the website when that's not a priority right now. Um, so, so, so let me stop you there. So, yeah. so when that happens, so good on Roman for, you know, 
calling it out and, and trying to get you back on path. But when that happens, so when you do that, uh, and I don't know which one to use, the, which one to use the bigger offender, Nick or Omar? I'd Omar. probably say, okay. I mean, right. it's, not, so, I'm not, it's not a full 100%, <laughs> all right? Uh, I'll say it's like 60 40. It's like I'm on a little bit heavier, but Nick's not a, you know. Well, so, that's so, we're both visionaries, right? So, so, so here's here's what I want to hear, Omar. You go first. Is when in that moment when you're doing it, what are you thinking? Why why do you do it? It's just imp- I don't know if it's impulsiveness or speed. I I, I am uh, I operate I think a higher speed level than it's even okay. should that because it can be too fast for just too quick, and so I think it's probably uh, impulsiveness and or just a need but, for so you're moving guys. before thinking you're moving just you're just moving thinking. before thinking yeah uh okay nick when you when you, when you do it what, what what's going on there why do you do it, it it's similar i mean i have a tendency to have knee-jerk reactions or if, if an yeah. idea hits my head i think i'm going to forget about it so i want to send it to the person because i want to see a, it, it resolved or feel like i'm getting it off my chest but yeah. one thing that, that did occur to me as as we were talking through this is uh you know when before Roman came along, I was sort of the de facto integrator, uh, and, and Omar was the pure visionary. Uh, that's kind of how we were operating, even though we didn't call okay. ourselves that. That's kind of how we okay. were operating. And and now I would say it's it's I'm almost kind of like because I'm 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 very married to the EOS model. I, I'm kind of like this integrator visionary buffer. Like I'm more of a visionary. I skew that way, uh, but. You know, I'll, I'll try to remind Omar from time to time if he gets upset that Roman was calling him out to, to calm, you know, to calm down with, with rattling the team. I'll remind Bro- Omar, hey, look, we got to both chill out because it's, right. it's, it's distracting the team. Uh, right. And 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 so I think that I think that has worked well also, uh, you know, from from a dynamic standpoint. And then, uh, you know, we, we, look, we argue on the text string as well from time to time. But it, that gets back to the way things were in the early days where. Yeah. No matter what we call ourselves or call each other on that text string, and sometimes Roman's just a, a calm observer to Omar and my, you know, married arguments. Uh, you know, uh, uh, well, that's, I was going to say that Roman's always got in a in a tough position because it's either two v one, uh, me and Nick started ganging up ganging up on him, or he's got to be like the the middleman with the two kids in between, the right? Are fighting the mediator. Each other. So it's it's a yeah. it, 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 he's got a thankless job sometimes. I'll, I'll, I'll say, actually, to Nick's point, I think Omar is a pure visionary, and I think Nick sometimes does a really good job of seeing the bigger picture, and he will actually sometimes, in reflection, will say, you know what, or actually, um, but they're both guilty of the same stuff, and I think it's because I put up a lot of red tape, right? I know what limitations our team right. has. Uh, obviously more intimately than Nick and Omar do, I realize the bandwidth concerns, resource constraints, and quite frankly, just, you know, prioritization. So right. they will be like, I to Nick's point, he's knee-jerk. I want it done, and I want it done now. And that's this thing in this moment, and then he'll have 10 other things he wants done now. The team might just feel like they're on fire. So for right. me, I'm going to put red tape. I'm going to go sit down and talk to the team. And something that Nick and Omar might want done now might – take two months if I get involved. So like at some points they get frustrated with that, with me, right? right. As this red tape, you know, and to, to Omar's point, he moves at a higher velocity. Right. And I think it's a balance. I think there are many times where Nick and Omar have gone around me and it was fewer than, the, it's not, not the typical situation, but you know, in the rare moments, that was the right thing to do because it was something that I probably would have put too much, um, I'm not gonna say paralysis, but you know, analysis by paralysis, but I probably have slowed down something that was a huge opportunity. And so the visionaries do sometimes take the right they, – they, they try to be good about when they do it. I don't think they do it quite as much as, as they think they do because yeah. I, I, one of the things they do is they invest in me, right? They sent me right. to the COO Alliance, and I met with other integrators. They sent me to an EOS um, a training uh, program, and I talked to other integrators, and their visionaries are way more – in terms of seagull management, so, so much more distracted by shiny, shiny distractions. So I credit Nick and Omar for our success as much as, as myself and, and my team. Yeah, love, yeah, and, and, love, you know, we, love that. Mark, we do an yeah. exercise where we map out our vision uh, when we're doing the vision, the VTO stuff, because you kind of asked how do we stay aligned from a vision yeah. standpoint. So Omar will actually write down vision, I'll write down vision, but then we'll have sort of a, 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 a and as part of our same page, you know, 
figure out where are we aligned, where are we divergent, right. uh, collectively, where do we want to make sure we're, we're all committing to, you know, the go forward uh, approach here. So, and what I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, one thing I'll say is, you know, in our however many years, 16, 17 years of being business partners, we fought about a lot of things, but the one thing we tend to never disagree about is the vision, um, which I think to, to your point, Mark, at the beginning of the call is probably a rarity that best friends and, and, and business partners can sort of make it this, this long. I think it's, it's, it's a credit to having that alignment of, of vision. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, it's, it's special. It's special. Um, all right. So one last question here that I'm really curious about when, well, let me ask it this way. Are there anything that Nick and Omar talk about that Roman's not a party to? Nothing that would be like, there, yeah, it, no, I mean, it'd be more yeah. person, like, you know, we're still buddies. So, you know, we'll, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, bi- I'm, I mean, business yeah. bi- specific to business, no, is, yeah. is there any business stuff that's kind of you, you carve off that's not, not part of this, this triad thing that you got yeah. going? No, there's really not. I mean, the, 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 it would be something very inconsequential or just not even like, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it, sometimes it might be impulsive stuff that we just forgot to include Roman on. And I'll give you an example. This is actually maybe an example of something where we jump jump the line on a visionary idea, but it was timely. So a year ago, when the whole NCAA was getting ready to pay, allow athletes to be paid, Omar jumped in his car, drove down to Miami, and signed the quarterback of the University of Miami at twelve. Of course, he did. Uh, you know, to be yeah, to be the very first company to sign a college athlete to an NIL deal. Uh, barely discussed it with me. He texted with texted me about it on his way down to Miami as he's going. He's like, "Hey, we're going to sign the quarterback at twelve midnight tonight. We're going to be on ESPN, and it's going to be this great news headline." And sure enough, it was a national headline. Our company is still mentioned in any news uh, conversations around college athlete NIL deals. Uh, and Roman kind of found out about that one after the fact. Uh, and and but it ended up being a you know a great outcome for for the business. But to answer your actual question. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, we, we did a more more significant transaction in our business a year ago where we took on some private equity yeah. uh, investment. Uh, Roman was the first person in our organization to be involved in the discussion that we were thinking about moving in that yeah. direction as, as founders as, and as the sole shareholders. It yeah. uh, was intimate in, in, you know, what that would look like and, and very, you know, uh, involved in the conversation. So uh, from a strategic standpoint, there's really be... I looked at our text message, Nick, it's a... It's- you have no Roman on. It was about a T-shirt for college. Oh yeah, the, the, the last text message I sent Omar, which Roman wasn't copping on, was about a college hunks T-shirt that said. You got me curious. Life. I'm like, Dude, I was like, what college? So I started looking. So Roman, you know they've got this side text, right? Yeah. <laughs> of course. I imagine every now and then they probably vent about me putting up too much red tape here and here and there. Oh wait, there's one more. There's the the wrapped RV. The <laughs> oh yeah, Omar. Yeah, Omar's wrapping his RV. Omar's wrapping his RV with college hunks, kind of like the college game day uh, RV uh, for me as oh, so nice. Those are the kind of silly things that uh, yeah. we end up talking about without, because we just we don't want to bother Roman with those distractions. Nice. Those silly I love things. it. That's the visionary fun zone. I love that. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, well, I tell you what, I, I really appreciate what you guys have, have done and what you're doing. And I admire, again, the, the two close friends being able to, to have that trust foundation and, and, and let the egos, uh, you know, be to the side to grow, to get to a point you bring in, find somebody, identify somebody like Roman that I can tell is a, is a really special person here that I, I could probably guess that humility is one of your core values. Uh, you know, I just kind of, I kind of hear that in, in the way that you guys talk to each other and, and give credit to each other. And so uh, it sounds like you're, you're making a big difference out there in the world. Uh, anything well, before we kind of wrap this thing up, anything else that, that we got to talk about before we get out of here? I mean, I just want to share a, a great deal of gratitude to you and Gino and the whole EOS family uh, for, you know, putting this material out there for, for small business owners and entrepreneurs to have a framework to follow that's simple, that makes perfect sense, and it actually works and, and is not impossible or, or difficult to, to execute or, or implement. So uh, huge you saved lives. lives. You saved my life. Yeah. Wow. Literally, literally. literally. He, wow. 
huge, huge credit to uh, to you guys. And this is a surreal experience for us to be on this podcast to share our story and how you've been able to to impact it and and the thousands of employees and, and you know hundreds of thousands of customers that we've touched. And so you've done that with so many small businesses. So it's really cool. Thank you. Wow. Well, that that means means the world to me. Thank thank you guys. You're you're the reason. Uh, you're the whole reason, frankly. Uh, I, you know, I believe the entrepreneurs make all the difference and uh, all the good we want to see in the world. You know, entrepreneurs can can do a lot of it. So I uh, appreciate you you living that out. And uh, if, if our listeners want to get in touch with you all, what's the best way to do that? They find you somewhere? Uh, LinkedIn, what, what should Twitter, they do? Uh, Instagram, or like a College Hunks. Or, uh, well, College Hunks. Uh, what's our website? CollegeHunks.com, Roman. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Integrator, uh, what's the website? Chris, spoken yeah. like a true visionary. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Um, and, com or collegehunks.com. Yeah. They both go to the same place. And then we're all on LinkedIn and Instagram and uh, any of the social media sites. Happy to connect with folks and uh, uh, applaud everyone listening for yes. continuing on the entrepreneurial journey. Fantastic. We'll put all that stuff in the show notes. And again, thanks so much for being here. And we'll see you next, next episode. Thank thanks you. so much, Mark. Take Appreciate care. you. Bye-bye.